He uh, works for FireEye. He's going to talk today about security onion automation and uh, in the security enterprise. He is a broologist and a proctologist and a brofile. So, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Hi everybody. I got an extra piece of paper here. So hi, I'm Mike Reeves. I uh, there's my ugly mug up on the thing. Um, I came to FireEye from the Mandiant acquisition. So Mandiant, a FireEye company, is the the proper nomenclature. Um, I got my start mostly in uh, the Unix security world. Um, a long time ago, I had a WooFTP server, went to work, went to log on to, or I had a server, it had WooFTP running on it, went to log in from work, couldn't get on, something changed, the key had changed, what the heck's going on? Well, I was owned, and, uh, and I had just built it that morning, so that sort of got me into information security a long time ago, and ever since then, I've really been focused on intrusion detection, and you know, locking down Unix machines and playing with uh, Unix stuff. My first few years were with Windows, unfortunately. I, um, but I'm, I'm all good with that. I, I spent 12 years at a Fortune 5 company that may or may not be a sponsor of this event. Um, and uh, I created Onion Salt for Security Onion. So people have been talking about NSM today. For those who don't know what NSM is, this is the official Richard Baitlick uh, definition. I'm a Richard Baitlick fan. Um, those are his books at the top. Am I too low? No. All right. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, if you haven't read any of these books, I suggest they're really good. But um, the official um, Richard definition is it's the monitoring is the collection, analysis, and escalation of indications and warnings to detect and respond to intrusions. I look at this as the way to give the analyst everything they need to make a conscious decision if something is evil or not. Um, you know, we, there's been a lot of talk about automation and talk about you know how do I look at an event and how do I get that um, determined if that's evil quickly. Um, if you don't have all the right context, that becomes slightly difficult. So the more context you can give the analyst, the quicker they can do make a determination, the quicker they can knock it out. So instead of saying, you know, this is what IDS is, and this is what NSM is, I'd like to use a scenario that actually happened. Um, I was helping a buddy out, and uh, they had a, um, they, were, they were at a new company, and, you know, they, they had some security problems. We'll just leave it at that. Um, so we stood up some security onion boxes, and, uh, you know, it, this was a drive-by attack. I think there was a flash vulnerability a couple of year, a year or two ago um, that people were exploiting the crap out of that, um, you know, they would hit a website, they would uh, say, hey, download this from a secondary website, and then it would run that file, and then, you know, they were in it. So, from a typical IDS perspective, you would see this alert come in, say, okay, somebody did a drive-by attack. Okay, did it work? Did it not work, right? So, eh, this is pretty fresh, so let me tell the IT guys, you know, hey, um, check this machine out, right? So, you open a request with support, is this still following? They're still doing a great job. Yeah. Cool. Um, so they, you open a thing with the, you know, you follow the process. Hey, IT dudes, go check out this box, right? This thing looks to be owned, sauced. It's, it's, it's bad. So they go out, and what do they do? They run antivirus on it, right? Man, this thing's up to date. It's clean. These guys in security, they don't know what they're doing, man. These guys are idiots, right? So that's what you get from them because, hey, the antivirus machine said, hey, it's clean. I'm good, right? So if you take that same type of event um, and you apply it with NSM, that alert comes in, it looks, looks kind of funny. Let me look at it. So I pull up the transcript through Squeal if I'm using Security Onion, and I see that, you know, hey, this looks like the exploit code. I see it um, telling it to do stuff. I see it um, say, hey, go download this. So that's very interesting. So um, I then use Bro, the Bro logs in Elsa to determine that, you know, hey, this box did uh, go out and did download the second stage piece of this malware, right? So it's like whatever.exe. Um, and when I take that whatever.exe out of PCAP from the Squeal console and run it on VirusTotal, I find out the vendor that they didn't use actually identified it as a type of malware. So we told them, hey, we've got this malware. Um, you know, we ran through VirusTotal, it's bad. This machine's owned, please take it off the network. I don't know, man. Uh, antivirus says it's clean. 
So they still wouldn't believe us. So what I did was I took that and I ran it through Mastiff, um, which is another sandbox thing that was talked about, and found out that after whatever .exe runs, it's like awesome.exe is running in the system. And so I said, is this running? And I said, oh, by the way, I'm looking at the bro logs, and this thing has some connections to Ukraine and Turkey. As I understand, you guys don't do a lot of business there. Um, so finally, finally, they're like, okay, well, they sent it to their vendor, and the vendor's like, oh, yeah, this is new. This is new. We've never seen this before. So security one, IT zero. We had a little vindication there. Um, but that's the big difference in NSM, right? That's all the context so that I was able to do all those things right away, right at my desk. I didn't have to do look at a bunch of different things and get a bunch of information. I, I had it all there. So with that, what are the challenges of NSM in the enterprise? So the biggest one is convincing your management and your network teams that it's important to have this, right? Because um, it's a network security monitoring, so the network team gets involved. Um, management, because you're going to ask them for some money of some sort. Um, Figuring out where to put these things is another good one. Um, High-speed connectivity, uh, as you can, as you know, um, bandwidth is getting faster and faster and faster, um, and that causes problems with uh, um, with uh, you know typical hardware. You can't use like a 486 desktop and uh, monitor a 10 gig connection. Um, compliance and data privacy are a big one. It's kind of boring, but it's very important. Um, how you manage all these devices, and then the highlighted one is dealing with the data. You get a lot of crap out of this, right? Especially if you have uh, a network that's running wild. So let's just get compliance out of the way. Um, so whenever you're going to do something like this, check your legal department because you are doing full packet capture. Am I, my mic still checked out? Um, do you just want to hold it? No, nah, we'll figure this out. Mm. We're going to take this off. Right. Please don't kick anyone out. Please don't kick our speaker out of the conference. All right. All right. Try this again. So before you do this, get, get with your legal department because you are doing full packet capture. So you, you, you are going to get um, some PII. You're going to get other things on there. Um, you really want to check with them if that's going to be cool in the gang or not. Um, if you have a global deployment, um, France and Germany and all these people, they're, like, they take privacy serious. So... Uh, there's a lot of things you can't do there, um, so it's good to get, you know, all that involved, get all those people involved. Um, limit the access to your grid. What I mean by this is that, um, and we'll, actually we'll get into it in a second here, but limit your access to it. You don't want everybody and their cousin have access to, hey, these sensors are cool, man. Let me get on there. Let me get an account. Um, learn BPFs that can save you. Um, so a situation where you have something that says PCI or something like that where you can't um, you can't store the data, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, run snort rules against the data. That doesn't mean you can't keep connection information uh, from the data. Um, so you want to keep those, um, and, you, and by using BPFs, you can say, okay, for net sniff, if we're using that, um, for this source and this destination, do not do PCAP for it, right? So you get, you don't get the ultimate visibility that you would like, but you do still get something instead of just saying, oh, let's just ignore it, even though that's a very important system, right? So, how do you convince your managers? The easiest way, uh, and this is very effective, so if you're going somewhere and you, know, they, you ask our IT department, hey man, are we secure? Yeah, we're awesome. Are antiviruses up to date? You know, we got firewalls up in here. Um, stand up a security on an instance on their egress point, and you will see lots of fun stuff, right? Um, you know, <laughs> the... Uh, the best is when the guy that's telling you that they're super duper secure is like the guy that's got like some C2 stuff and they're using um, that person's laptop to do all kinds of nasty stuff on their network. Um, the, um, the other good thing is that NSM can be done well on commodity hardware. You don't need a super duper uh, server if you've got a 10 meg connection to the internet or 20 meg connection to the internet or 100 meg connection to the internet. You can use a relatively small inexpensive server to do this. Um, and just to, uh, you know, add some scare tactics, um, you know, the uh, attackers are normally on there for a long time before they're being detected, right? And that's, you know, some average stuff from some of the incident response. And I got that from Mandiant, a FireEye company, uh, website. 
So, taps are the way to go. I'll just say it that way. Um, so the sca taps scare network teams, right? They're like, oh my gosh, there's this device that's in between, you know, this router and the switch. And it's like, well, you do have a network cable between those two, too, right? So um, a tap is basically when I when people give me a lot of crap about them, I say it's just like a network cable, especially if you're using a dumb tap. Um, if it's an optical tap, the only way you can break it's mirrors, right? So the only way you can, you know, if it if it comes defective, yeah, it doesn't work. But the only way to break a, f a fiber tap is to drop it on the floor while it's running, then you can probably break it. But for the most part, they run. We had, at my previous employer, we had something in the neighborhood of 800 and something taps, and we had one that was a possible failure. Um, but we were never able to prove that it was a failure. So we had lots of these out there, and they had a very good track record. Um, so why use a tap instead of, instead of spans, or our span? Yeah, you know what I mean? I could hit a button, I got the span port. Well, switches weren't uh, designed to do that. Um, you'll get, if you've got like a five meg connection or a two meg connection, yeah, you'll be all right. Um, but, you know, if you've got, let's say a 6500 that's got, you know, tons and tons of users on it, there's this little thing called packets per second on a switch. And for everything you mirror, it's like, hey, we'll just do this whole blade. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll mirror this whole VLAN over there. Well, great. That's your server VLAN. It's all your stuff. You're, you're pushing a couple million packets per second. Well, guess what? You just doubled it, right? Um, then you've got this other sniffer thing that the network team uses for something um, like some Arbor stuff or something. Then you doubled it, you know, you added that same number again. Well, what happens when the switch, I think um, on a 6500 Super 720, the limit by default is something like 12 million packets per second. Uh, once it hits that, it's a bye-bye switch, right? So it just like full meltdown. So yeah, it was cool. We saved a lot of money and made a lot of people feel better that we, you know, we weren't going to put a tap in there to, to jeopardize their network. But on the flip side, we melted the whole switch down and uh, that was fun. Um, the other piece is network teams like to steal the ports. Um, so uh, because somebody can log into the switch or evilguy.com could go in there and uh, change the port and, and blind you. Um, try to use dumb taps wherever possible. The only taps that I've ever seen fail are aggregation taps. Um, because they do have a lot of smarts in them, and uh, the more compli you know, the more complicated stuff. And just a pro tip: um, label your interfaces that have taps. So if you're a network person and you're putting a tap in between a switch and a router, put a little note in there that says "tap." Um, and the reason to do that is because when you go to make a change, say, "Hey, uh, this is a hundred meg link. I want to change it to a gig," and it's hard coded on the tap. And then you're trying to figure out for four hours why I can't upgrade my link to a gig. It's because the tap is set to 100, and that's why. If you would have just labeled it and known the tap in there, you could have gone to the little dip switches, changed it, and, be, and been good. So a little bit about sensor placement. Um, we always want to get the true, the true source and true destination. Um, you always want to get your, your ingress and egress, um, your VPN on the inside. Does anybody know why you would want to get your VPN on the inside instead of the outside of the VPN? All right, great. Um, yeah, so that would be because uh, that would be because it's encrypted. So you're not really going to see much except a bunch of encrypted packets. Um, Third-party connectivity or acquisitions are very important. Um, these groups like to say, "Hey," or uh, companies like to say, "Hey, we're buying such and such." Well, if you've got a relatively mature security organization, chances are small company X that you're buying might not have said. Uh, sophisticated security group. So um, that's a very good tactic for them to use is to own somebody that you're going to eventually connect to your network. So they wait and wait and wait. And then all of a sudden, hey, thanks. Thanks for turning that on. Now I can do what I need to do. Um, you know, if you've got a secret sauce network or, you know, where you're storing your, your, your recipe for Pringles or whatever you're doing, um, it's good to put visibility there as well. Um, and then try to avoid asynchronous routing where possible. And that's getting harder in larger networks, right? So let's say you have two data centers in the same city. Traffic might come in one link and go out the other. Um, and the network team likes to do that because, you know, hey, it's cool. So in this situation, in my diagram here, um, does, it, does anybody know why just having the tap um, down here Why that's not sufficient from a standpoint of, of monitoring web traffic? And uh, Mike P and Jason, that you're not allowed to answer. Does anybody know why that it's not sufficient? 
All right, all right. So um, the reason it's not sufficient is because the, all the destination addresses you're going to see are going to be, right, they're going to be destined for that proxy. So if you know that, you know, your threat actor likes to come from, let's say, the Ukraine, well, if you're looking for some certain IP address ranges or something like that, you're not going to see it. They're going all to 10 dot whatever, right? Um, and some people like to put 10 dots in their intel. So I guess you could get some things out of there. Um, <laughs> So that's what the other one is. Now, in this case, you have to stitch things together. Let's say if you get an alert on your external one, you have to do a little analysis to figure out, hey, which internal host was it? So, so I didn't have a cool Top Gun picture here, but um, so one of the things I was tasked with several several years ago was how to do 10 gig, um, and I thought that was hard. And now it's how do I do 100 gig? Um, so network speeds in the enterprise are growing quickly as more and more data is out there. Um, Generally, with a uh, commodity hardware-based sensor, you can do about two gig. Um, you can go faster with a single box, but then you're talking like $15,000 network cards, very expensive. Um, so to do this with cheap commodity stuff, you need to balance the flows. So flow-based load balancing. Does anybody know about flow-based load balancing? Great, great, awesome. Um, so flow-based lo load balancing um, allows, us to, uh, allows us to take a 10 gig connection and say split it into um, you know, four two gig connections. Um, so the, the cool part is like if you think of um, sticky bits in the F5 world, same thing happens with the flow-based load balancer. Um, everything between that hash, you know, from they use like, depending on the device you're using, they come up with some hash that says source destination, source port, destination port. And they make sure all that traffic goes to the same sensor because you know, these tools don't work very well if, not the, whole, you know, if the whole conversation isn't there. Um, so, Bro is awesome in this category, right? So, it, let's say these three boxes are just running Snort. In that case, I don't know what box one and box two, or you know, box one doesn't know what box two's got going on, and box three does, has no idea what's going on with the other ones. So, um, with Bro, they do, right? So they can talk to each other. So let's say you have an advanced Bro script that says, if I see this type of um, event happen, and something then turns around and creates a TCP connection on this port. Well, if that TCP connection goes to the second box and you're, you find this first stuff on the first box, you're kind of SOL. It's like, whatever, nothing ha bad happened. I'm cool in the gang. No, nothing, nothing's wrong. Um, but since we have Bro, um, we do know about that. So we can write logic and things to do that. So, okay, I've been yapping about this for a while. So, what would a large-scale enterprise deployment of NSM look like? So in this case, we have um, you know, about 20 gig to the internet, 40 gig to the, to the DMZ, um, and then 40 gig to the secret sauce network. And you notice I don't have you know, as many sensors as I do um, what the, the bandwidth says, because just because it's a 40 gig physical connection doesn't mean it's normally pushing 40 gig. Um, a lot of times you find that the network team's all like, yeah, man, this thing's going to be crazy. And then you look at it and it's, you, know, you put a 10 gig connection, you're pushing like three megs. So, um, but this allows you to scale as the network grows. So if you're at a place that uses a lot of bandwidth um, and you keep upgrading and upgrading and upgrading, instead of like, okay, crap, this sensor will not do anymore. I got to buy a $40,000 sensor. You just add another you know, $7,000 box to the back end. You're, you're good to go. So tell us, Bob, what do we want now that we have a bunch of sensors? We do now have a very, very unique security architecture that we have to support. Um, you're going to get tons of pushback from your, from your peers, right? The network team is not going to like you. Um, this is infrastructure, you, and I, I mentioned this before, this is infrastructure that you don't want your support teams to manage. And why, does anybody know why you don't want your support team to manage them? Okay. Um, because those are the people that get targeted the most, right? I mean, why target a user that has access to their desktop when you can target the user who has open, you know, to the Active Directory forest for the entire company? Um, so what you need is a robot to do all the boring stuff. Um, because you're there to do security analysis and stuff like that, not add DNS entries or users. So one of the biggest questions I get is about harbor sizing. Okay, I want to do this, right? Like in IRC, this comes up all the time. Liam, I'm sure you've seen this a million times. What do I need for this, man? What do I, what do I need? Um, it depends, right? And I know that's a crappy answer, 
but it depends. So let's say you have a 10 gig connect, or let's say you have a gig connection, and it runs 800 megabits, and it's all Samba. You're going to get a lot better performance from Snort because you have like four Samba rules. Um, now, if you got that same situation, it's all HTTP traffic, and that's where most of your rules are from an emerging threats perspective, then yeah, you're going to have a situation where it's not going to perform as good. The more cores, the more traffic you can handle, and don't be cheap. RAM is cheap. So the more mega RAMs, the better. So my hardware recommendations for 100 meg. I'm an Intel processor person, I mean, you can use the AMDs, just get eight, eight threads, like so an eight core AMD in this case. Um, 16 gigs of RAM, again, that's cheap. Software RAID should be cool in the game because you'll be able to uh, uh, keep up from a PCAP um, perspective. I mean, you always want to have multiple NICs, right? You got to have more than one because uh, you need management and at least one monitor if you're using spans, which you shouldn't. You should use taps when you can, but in a pinch you can use spans. So to get, how do I get up to two gig, right? So um, Obviously, we need more threads. So we've got two six-core hyperthread processors. So you've got about 24 threads, um, 128 gigs of RAM, and um, hardware RAID 5 um, with as many disks as possible. And does anybody know why we need many disks as possible? Retention. Well, that, that's one of them, right? And the spindles, there you go. So because we're writing, um, we're writing data really fast, the more disks the faster you can write it, right? As well as more space. And PCI Express NICs. Um, those are very important. So now we got all this data, right? And this could be its own talk, and I'm, not, I'm just going to kind of glance over it a little bit. Um, you know, just like the previous talk, no matter how cool this stuff is, you've got to have smart people that know how to look at the output. So just because it's an alert, you know, you don't want to steal the CEO's machine down because he has a false positive on there, right? Um, that would be a CLM. So, um, you know, but what you want to do is create context for you or your analysts, right? So in this case, name your, naming your sensors is things something that's like, oh, I'll just call it sensor one. We're cool, right? You know it's a sensor. But if you help somebody and says, okay, this is a VPN sensor or this is an internet sensor. so. Um, if you have an internet sensor that's talking about some sort of RPC connection or some sort of remote desktop session that, you know, that came from that sensor and it was actually going through, that might be a little bit more suspicious um, by having that context, where if it was like an internal sensor, people RDP, what whoop, whoop, whoop do you do, right? <sighs> um, have a, so the cool part about the flow-based load balancer, like I was mentioning before, is you can have, um, you can have a copy of the traffic. So having a copy of the traffic lets you test rules, right? So there's been many times in my previous life where, you know, we got something going on, let's roll this rule out. Well, there's a typo in it, right? And with start has a typo, bad things happen, as in they don't start. Um, so testing that is really good, or if it's a really crappy written rule, um, and sometimes you have to have junky rules. I mean, if you've got an, an event that's going on right now, and the only way to detect it is something that's really crappy, then uh, that's what you got to live with. And then stage your rollouts, right? Roll it to a couple sensors first. Don't slam it out there with everything. So, does anybody not know about Security Onion? Thank you. So, Security Onion is uh, created by Doug Burks. Um, it's a great thing to get started with. It's got huge community support. It definitely works, and you can go check out his blog and, and all that. Um, this has been you know, a tool that's, uh, that I've, when people ask me, how do I get into information security? How do I do these things? I say, hey, go get Security Onion, go stick it on your internet connection, and, and just watch it. Um, but what are, you know, it's cool, but when you try to take it into your business, there's there's some problems, right? So one of those is, you know, once you have a bunch of sensors, it becomes a pain in the butt, right? Get somebody new, you got seven sensors, you gotta go out and create user accounts on those seven boxes. A lot of what Mike was talking about, right? Um, uh, rule management is kind of a bummer. So how it works right now is that once a night, it goes and grabs the emergency threat rules. Um, then 
the, the sensors wait five minutes, then they grab it from the master, and then they restart. So every night that process happens. Well, if you've got something going on where you're trying to tune or something like that, you can see where that could be a pain, right? I need to turn off these five rules because they're blowing up. I gotta go to each sensor, run this thing. It's a pain. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there that you probably won't use. Um, and then there's definitely a learning curve, right? So there, even though um, a lot of things are simple, I mean, the output of these tools can be somewhat confusing, right? If the first time you've ever looked at Wireshark is when you pulled this up, You've got, you got a ways to go. So just a couple tips before I, before I dig into the automation stuff, and these are hard lessons I've learned, is uh, set up your uh, slash NSM partition before you run SO setup. Um, a million times I've installed a sensor and then forgot to initiate the big secondary disk I had on there to support the, the store the PCAP. Um, create your bridged interface before you do it if you're running a tap. Um, that's very important. Turn off all the stuff you don't need and use it every day. And what I mean by that is that one of the main um, components is squeal. And if you're not keeping up with your events, it starts to get a little clunky as far as uh, you know using it. If there's a lot of uncategorized events, it, it gets a little unhappy. So with all that, I decided that, hey, um, onion salt sounds better than puppet strings. So I was trying to think of like a quirky name that I could use for it, and uh, um, me and Mike used to work together, so in able to troll him, I chose something other than Puppet, uh, because that's all he talked about. Um, so I decided to use SaltStack, um, and there's my GitHub that has all these scripts. So I, I, the first thing I changed was user management. I hate creating users. Um, and then I changed the rules, because it was you know kind of bootleg. So user management. So now the users are managed centrally. Um, by default, if you use these scripts, the, the user is granted sudo. Um, they're created with no passwords, using keys instead of passwords. Um, in the scripts, you can add your user accounts to that init file, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail here in a second. And then you just copy the user's key in that directory. So that's really it. So to give an example, um, so Joe Admin is the, when you install Ubuntu, because security on using Ubuntu, the first user you create is already in the pseudos group. So in this case, Joe Admin created all the boxes. Um, and then Sensor Dude, he's a, he's a sensor guy. Um, I added him to the pseudo group. You could change the group names, you can do all these kinds of stuff, but it's you know, similar to what Mike showed with Puppet, but with Onion Salt, that's, you know, that's all you do. And you just create that and it keeps going on. Um, this is very handy dandy. Uh, especially when you add somebody new, especially when you get up to like the 20 or 30 sensor stuff. Um, even if you have a shell script that does it for you, you have to loop through each box and then if there's a problem, it's, it's a pain. But this is where it gets better, right? So rules, right? Um, so the, the problem with um, the way security did, did rules, for me at least, was I didn't want to restart every night. Um, I wanted to be able to tune actively. Um, so I wanted to start every time it's all changed. So it checks in every 15 minutes by default. You can change that, there's a little cron, cron job. Um, so it just monitors the rules directory. And then if it sees it, it only restarts snort. So that's what that whole um, only snort alert stuff is in there. Um, this, come, this came in very handy, especially if you're in the middle of an event, because, um, and you can force the, like the other situation with, with Salt is you can force uh, all the agents to check in. You can force them to run everything. Um, so here's some of the some tips and tricks with, with Salt in general. So um, if you want to run a command on everything, use the wildcard star here. Um, and you know we're going to grab the kernel that's running on everything. Um, you can update all the you know packages on all the sensors as, as long as you follow the right naming convention. So naming convention is very important. Um, you can install a specific, specific package on a sensor, uh, on the sensor. So let's say you want to put BWMNG, which is a pretty cool utility, um, on all your sensors. You can just run that command and boom. Um, and then if you need to reboot everything, let's say you do a kernel update. Um, this is very important because what happens is, is now that you've got 
one sensor and you're managing it this way, it doesn't matter how many sensors you have anymore. You manage them exactly the same if there's one or a thousand. Now there's a little bit more infrastructure in the background that's involved with it, but from a day-to-day -day usage perspective, um, you know, it's not a big deal. We had 500 sensors at, our, at, at my last place and um, people were like, well, we need to add 20 more sensors. I'm like, okay. Right, because managing one is the same as managing 200 with just a little bit more back-end infrastructure. So as, you, as long as you manage them the same way and you do the same thing, that's what SALT gives you, sort of like what Puppet, um, well, exactly like how Puppet does ex as well. So this is in, um, this is in the Security Onion packages. Uh, it's in experimental mode right now, so when you install Security Onion, um, it'll ask you, do you want to use SALT to manage this? This is what this is derived from. Um, so on the roadmap, um, centralizing ELSA is one of the big things I want to do. Um, I'm not sure how many people use um, ELSA or use Security Onion on a daily basis. Um, how ELSA is configured today is uh, ELSA lives on each sensor, right? And it's a distributed search to make it go faster, right? So if I want to search all connectivity between this host and that host on every sensor, I've seen it. Hey, all ELSA boxes, bring me back. What I've, what I've, you know, what I'm, what I've seen. The problem with that, though, is you're on the same, the same device that you're holding that information on is also where you're storing your PCAP. And PCAP likes to eat up disk, right? That's its job. It's just, you know, writing uh, as much data to disk as it can. Um, so that limits your retention. Well, you might want to know six months from now because, again, remember the 290 something day thing that you might need to just, you know, you, don't, you didn't have a snort signature or a bro policy that would have caught it back then, but you found a binary on some box that was involved in something else that was dated back, you know, let's say three months ago. Well, what did it all talk to you after that, right? So you would search it and say, oh, shoot, it was talking to a bunch of domain controllers. Maybe we should go check out those domain controllers, right? And then you start building this cascaded uh, um, picture of of everything this thing did, and all you have is connection information, right? And that you got from Bro. But because you've centralized it, you can have that retention go there. So that's one of the things that's coming. Um, another one that's coming very soon is Bro Threat Intel support. So if you haven't checked out the Intel framework for Bro, I would definitely check it out. Um, this is a way to track IP addresses or domain names that you know are evil. Um, you can add a little context to them that say, you know, hey, um, I got this from you know, this service, or I know it's part of this threat actor. Um, you can put all those things in there. Uh, multiple rule set support. So uh, what we talked about before where we had different naming conventions is you might want to run different policies on those different places, right? So um, internal, you might have different things you want to look for versus what you want to see on VPN. You might want to be a little bit more stingy on VPN or third parties. So that's coming. Um, that one is, uh, that one's actually pretty easy. I just haven't had time to do it yet. Um, centralized configuration management. Um, that's where you have all the configuration information in one spot. Um, so the, you know, all the information about the box, what interfaces are supposed to be in, what bond interfaces, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as a, uh, a CentOS server that works with a security on back, security on your back end. Um, and personal experience I've had, um, yeah, I don't want to start a religious debate here, but I've had um, better luck with CentOS from a performance perspective and um, you know, a lot of high-speed things. Um, but some people have, have had better luck with uh, Ubuntu, but I just wanted to give people options and say, hey, um, you know, here's the, the stuff that runs on security. So out of all that, um, you know, the, the key things when doing NSM in the enterprise are, and when you talk lots of boxes, is that your, your focus on the system sort of changes, right? So now that the robot is taking care of all of your infrastructure, the problems become more of chasing down issues. So because, let's say you have 10 terabytes, and I had sensors that had 10, 15 terabytes that would turn their disk over in a day, right? So you're writing every sector on every disk every day. Well, that causes uh, a little bit of a frequency and hardware failure, right? So hard drives like to go poof. So, you know, we found out that, you know, managing our grid, most of what we did was replace hard drives. That's, I mean, that was the big operational thing that you had to do. I mean, um, the automation tools handled all the normal stuff. Um, the only reason we had to connect the boxes was to rebuild the arrays 
after Dell came out and slapped a new drive in there. Um, if it wasn't an auto build. Um, the, the other thing is, is that um, if you have a large network, there's a lot of change. People will move things around, they'll upgrade connectivity, they'll change things. All of a sudden, this router isn't used anymore. We upgraded to another router, but we didn't look at this big blinky tap that was on there. We was like, what's that for? Um, so a lot of it becomes chasing down, looking for um, you know, the, the coverage that you've missed um, through that. Um, an another piece of advice would be, um, you know, just because you're seeing packet loss or, well, let me rephrase it. Just because you're seeing high load on a system. I've had boxes that have seen 20, 25, 30 uh, load averages. And some people, that's high. Well, that's why, you know, it's using 90% of CPU all the time. Well, if it isn't dropping any packets, it's doing its job, right? So you're going to beat the crap out of these boxes um, pretty much when you're doing this. And, you know, so a lot of people are like, well, we want to put this on a VM server. And we're going to cover like a, you know, a gig link. Well, you're going to roast the I/O on that VM server, just letting you know, just let the operations people know. Say, hey, you know, I'm going to be crushing the disk on this box. Um, the other thing is, is that when it comes to PCAP, it's very important to um, to look at your disk cache settings. So, um, how, especially when you have a lot of RAM. So, um, when you have a situation where you, let's say, you have 256 gigs of RAM. By default, unused memory in Linux gets used as file cache. Um, so you'll get awesome killer write performance for like you know five minutes. And then when it goes to actually write it, right? Because it's writing it to the cache, which is really, really fast, right? It's going from you know, the the um, you know it's it's going to memory. But then when it has to go to disk, all of a sudden you're seeing packet loss because crap, I'm you know, I'm crushing the I.O. right now trying to write this. So what you want to do is you want to get your um, you want to get your flushing. So PD flush is the is what you'll see when that's running. That means you're writing to disk. Um, you want to you want to play with your cache settings. And it's the reason I don't have any examples is because it's sort of a play with it thing. So um, you'll want to find out how based on the speed and what you can do so that you're almost writing constantly. Um, and when you do that, you'll find that uh, your performance will be a lot better. So those are about all the tips and tricks I have. Um, any questions? Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. <laughs>